So if work is key from everything for our folks with intellectual disabilities, for those in recovery, to those fleeing domestic violence, how is it that it suddenly becomes controversial when we turn to welfare programs to ask work-ready adults to work, train, or volunteer to receive their welfare benefits? How is that morally wrong or controversial? I worry about a country in which you say to a child that they shall go hungry because their parent can't find a job, has particular challenges. I do not think we need to do that in a country as great as ours. Welcome to the Cell Forum, a monthly Oxford-style debate series that features topics of special interest to libertarians. Thanks to the Smith Family Foundation for making this series possible. We're live at the Subculture Theater in New York City, but I'd also like to welcome our online audience for the live stream. I'm Gene Epstein, an economic journalist and the director and moderator of the SOHO Forum. Here's how tonight's debate will work. The audience initially votes for, against, or undecided on the resolution. And you can do that now by going to SOHOVOTE.com, S-O-H-O-V-O-T-E.com, SOHOVOTE.com. There you'll see the resolution and you'll be uh, able to vote for or against. We'll be closing uh, the voting in a few minutes, so please vote now on live stream. At the end of the debate, you'll have a chance to vote again and whoever moves the needle in his or her favor is declared the winner. Tonight's resolution is as follows. 15 million able-bodied adults on government welfare would have a better chance at economic betterment if they were taken off welfare. One more time, 15 million able-bodied adults on government welfare would have a better chance at economic betterment if they were taken off welfare. So get your votes in now. Also, for the audience at home, submit your questions in the comments, and we'll pick a couple to read out loud during the Q&A session. Now, on to the event. Defending tonight's resolution, we have Taryn Bragdon, President and CEO of the Foundation for Government Accountability. Taryn, please come to the stage. Opposing the resolution, we have Neera Tandon, President and CEO of the Center for American Progress. Neera, please come to the stage. We are now closing the voting. OK. Taryn Bracken. Taryn, you have 12 minutes to defend the resolution. 15 million able-bodied adults on government welfare would have a better chance at economic betterment if they were taken off welfare. Take it away, Taryn. This summer I met Dell, a young man from Cuba. He risked his life traveling from Cuba to Miami three years ago in a small boat with 13 others. Many of those 13 died. He swam two miles to shore as that boat sank. He did all that. He risked his life to work in America. And in just three short years, he's experiencing America to the fullest. He completed technical school, he got married, he has a child, and he's now working in construction. And as soon as he set foot on this land of opportunity, he started realizing his potential. He's living an American dream, and his children will never have to risk their lives to live the dream as well. Growing up, I had an aunt and uncle who never worked. They were both born in America, but tragically, they chose to trade the lifetime of opportunity for the certainty of monthly welfare. But free government welfare cash assistance, free government food, free government health care came at a high price. My aunt died in her 50s. And as I sat at her funeral, 
I thought of what might have been. She had so much to offer. She was born in America. But she, her husband, and her daughters were trapped in a lifetime of dependency. For decades, they lived on an island of despair, surrounded by welfare and no work. Two people, one America, but two vastly different outcomes. One risked his life to travel from despair to opportunity. Another, born in opportunity, but lived in despair and without hope. It didn't have to be that way. I want you to think about your first job for pay. Mine was actually uh, cleaning out the cow stalls in my parents' barn. And now I work in politics. Kind of same job, different shovel. <laughs> but whether it was my first job or every job after, work gave me new experiences and it showed me the possibilities in myself. Does welfare do that? I think it does the opposite. You want the simple truth? Welfare is so destructive because it pays people not to work. And so they don't. And they remain in dependency and poverty for a very long time. I founded the Foundation for Government Accountability because I've seen firsthand what America has to offer and the power of work, both in my own life and in others, and the tragedy of misguided government welfare programs. Our experts have testified in 30 states before numerous committees of both the US House and Senate, commissioned over 100 public opinion polls, and our reforms have been passed now in 34 different states. And those reforms mean that literally millions of Americans will move from welfare to work and on to a better life. First, I want to make sure we're on the same page about a few things. This debate is about, as Jean said, able-bodied adults of working age on welfare, people who are between 18 and 64 years old. It's not about those with disabilities. It's not about kids or the elderly. It's not even about adults whom social workers or doctors say are unable to work, whatever the physical or mental health reason might be. It's about people who can go to work tomorrow but do not able-bodied, think work-ready. And when I talk about welfare, I'm talking about able-bodied adults who receive welfare cash assistance, food stamps, and or Medicaid. I'm not talking about Social Security or Medicare. There are at least 15 million adults in America who fit this definition and are on at least one major welfare program. It's nearly record high welfare enrollment right now at the same time, we have near record low unemployment in most places. So who are these able-bodied adults? Well, most are white, most are under 35, nearly half are men, and most do not have young children at home. That's a problem. Welfare used to be this program that was targeted towards the truly needy, very poor children, those with disabilities, maybe the, uh, and also the frail and poor elderly. And none of us in this room would debate the importance of a government safety net for the truly needy. I support those programs. But able-bodied adults on welfare should have to work, train, or volunteer to receive their welfare benefits long term. Work or train 20 hours a week, or volunteer about 40 hours a month. Why? 97 and 16. What if I told you about a program that ensured that 97% of people on it would be out of poverty? Would you support it? Do you know what that program is? Any full-time job. 97% of people who work full-time are out of poverty. It's true, yet only 16% of able-bodied adults on Medicaid do work full-time. Just one in six and the majority report no earnings at all. I think we'd all agree that people are better off going to work. Look, welfare is not terrible, but it is terrible if it keeps people from working. And what's better, what's the best way to help people move from welfare to work? It's to require them to work, train, or volunteer. And do you know why I know that's true? We studied it. We actually tracked 60,000 people impacted by work requirements in two states, not just some of them, all of them. 
We tracked parents and childless adults, all of them able-bodied. We tracked folks on food stamps as well as those on cash assistance. And we found an inspiring outcome. Before work requirements in these programs, only a portion of individuals worked. See, it's not enough to want to work. We all need a push and a deadline. But after work requirements, most went to work right away. Incomes of those working doubled over time. And average income of those working were above the poverty limit within 12 months. And welfare enrollment for these individuals dropped an astounding 75 to 90%. With a work requirement, people are on welfare for just a short period of time. And there are human faces to this success. Take Jason. He signed up for food stamps in 2009, just as the Great Recession was hitting. But there he remained for four years. No job, no income, just welfare. 1,705 days. But when Kansas implemented the work requirement, Jason was among the first to leave. And in just over three months, he got a job in the publishing industry, making $45,000 a year. Was Jason bad or wrong because he was on welfare? No. But welfare was wrong and bad because it kept Jason trapped by keeping him at home and away from his next job. Or take Amanda. She was stuck on the program since 1993. 1993, she signed up for food stamps just a few months before Bill Clinton's inauguration. Nera might remember Hillary's husband. For 7,579 days, Amanda was trapped in dependency. But with the right policy in place, she quickly found a job and worked her way out of poverty. And you know what was the most interesting thing we found? We wondered if folks would move essentially from welfare to Walmart. But nothing could be further from the truth. Individuals moved into 600 different industries. 600 different industries. Less than 5% actually went into general retail or Walmart type stores. Many in healthcare, construction, technical positions. In fact, one in five started an attempt job and then often moved into permanent employment. Consider this other fact. In Texas, do you know how long a single mom on welfare cash assistance is on the program as she meets the work requirement? 22 days. That's right, just three weeks if she's meeting the work requirement. Work is so much more than a paycheck. Whose future would you bet on? A woman working a few hours and taking home $100? Or a guy not working at all and receiving that same $100 in food stamps? Who's more likely to get more hours another shift or a new job? Who feels better at the end of a day? But the true cost is not about the taxpayer spending. The true cost is the money not reaching the truly needy. Let me explain. At the same time we have near record welfare enrollment for able-bodied adults, we have 600,000 Americans with intellectual and developmental disabilities as well as frail kids and elderly on waiting lists for key Medicaid services. Because when you take a dollar away, or I'm sorry, when you take a dollar and give it to those choosing not to work, you take a dollar away from those waiting lists from cops, kids, or roads. Here's one of them. Not long after birth, a rare neurological condition forced Skylar Overman onto Arkansas's Medicaid waiting list. There she would wait for nearly 10 years. She was immobile and relies fully on her family for the help Medicaid provides. And from the beginning, her mother, Lindsay, fought for her daughter to get life-saving services and medication. But she's still on that waiting list. And there are more than 3,000, like Skylar, waiting in Arkansas alone. America is a rich country. But our nation's wealth is only as strong as the people working to support it. And this debate is not about what can we afford, it's about the cost to people's lives when they're trapped on welfare and in despair and don't experience the power of work. And the cost to those we're not serving, like Skylar. My father grew up in dysfunction, and my mother grew up in a family wrecked by alcohol. I'm number five of eight kids. And like Nira, I'm the direct beneficiary of parents who worked hard to overcome the challenges they faced or were born into. 
But that better life and the opportunity we both enjoy came as a direct result of their love and support, but also as a direct outcome of the hard work, employment, and opportunity they created. Don't we owe the same thing for those 15 million able-bodied adults trapped on welfare? Thank you. Your champion. 12, 12 minutes to, t to speak against the resolution. Take it away, Nira. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I want to thank Jean Epstein for inviting me, and uh, it's great to be here with all of you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak at the SOHO Forum, and I am uh, really enjoy, I hope I'll really enjoy the sparring with Taran. Uh, I guess I would just say, um, you know, at the essence, if we're having an argument about work and the value of work, I guess I would say I totally agree with Taryn that work is an incredibly important value. Uh, and I do think that we should respect work more in our society. What I disagree with fundamentally is a conflation of uh, people who receive support with those who aren't working. The true challenge in our society today, in my view, is that we have the growing crisis of the working poor. Taryn conflates three different programs, TANF, Medicaid, and food stamps. Uh, I understand why he conflates this, but one of those are traditionally considered welfare, temporary assistance for needy families. Medicaid and food stamps basically address two issues that people need, healthcare and food. At the end of the day, we only have two and a half million Americans on TANF today. Not 15 million, two and a half million Americans on TANF today. We passed TANF in the mid-1990s. Democrats and Republicans came together to pass that bill. Both said it would end poverty. It has not. Poverty has actually grown since the 1990s. The TANF program has not ended poverty in America. It has ended the welfare caseloads, but it has not actually ended poverty. I think our goal should be to move people out of poverty. I'm willing to look at conservative answers of that or liberal answers of that for that. But I think we should be crystal clear about what Taryn is talking about. Today, the TANF program were only operates for people who have children. There are no childless adults using TANF, or what most people call welfare. The Medicaid program, vast majority of people in the Medicaid program have children. Many, many of them are working. Food stamps, I think we do have a problem that a, working people are forced to use food stamps. That's a challenge. I see that challenge as one in which working people don't have a livable wage to afford food. I guess my basic principle difference here is that I think we should not say people in America should go hungry. Taryn thinks they should. I guess he thinks that you know if they go hungry for a while, that'll incentivize them not to go hungry. But let's be clear about some global facts. The United States provides less social service benefits than most countries in the OECD. That's a choice we've made. It is not the case that our labor force participation is greater than most countries in the OECD. In fact, many countries with a much stronger welfare state, have a much higher labor force participation rate. All the Nordic countries, Germany, all these countries have a higher labor force participation rate. If Taryn was right that a weak welfare state may higher labor force participation, that would not be true. We would, in fact, have the highest labor force participation rate. We do not. I think the true challenge in the United States is one in which we unfortunately have a lot of people who work 
make minimum wage and can't make ends meet. And that is what, the t that is what essentially food stamps and the Medicaid program are about. They're working people who don't have access to health care. Taryn says, if you're working and poor, you shouldn't have health care if your employer doesn't provide it. That's his right to say. I think that is not a principle that supports work. It's not expanding work to say we're going to get rid of health care for people who are working. People who make, who are working day in and day out do not have access to health care in the United States. And that is what the Medicaid program is about and the Medicaid expansion. I will note that he, he referenced a study that he did, uh, that his organization did in, around the Kansas program. Uh, some people have criticized that study. Peter Granis, who is a uh, conservative who worked for the Bush administration and others have said that, the, that there were flaws with that study, but particularly it said nothing about reducing poverty. These are not programs that reduce poverty, or the, the work he's done are not, do not help reduce poverty. I do think in the United States, we should do more to ensure that work pays. That means making sure and supporting programs where work will pay more. So people don't have to work a full-time job and be on food stamps to ensure their children don't go hungry. I think that is a terrible thing in the United States, but it happens. It happens all the time. You could argue that we're being too generous to the single mom who works at Walmart and uses food stamps to make sure her two kids are not going hungry. I do not think we are being too generous. In fact, I think as a country, we should think about how we can encourage work to pay a wage where people can raise their families. I, I agree, I believe we should have a stronger and higher minimum wage. That way, governments wouldn't have to subsidize families who are working. But libertarians have traditionally opposed that, and the minimum wage in the United States today is $7.25 an hour. I think if you think work should pay, Perhaps we should move off of some of those perspectives. I will say that I completely appreciate the perspective of the parents, Taryn's uncle. I, I hear the concern about Taryn's uncle and aunt staying at home and not working. But today, if you, uh, if you don't have kids, or even if you do have kids, you hit a Lifetime limit on, on TANF, and you were done. There is no, there are not places here where you can be on welfare for the rest of your life not working. That does not exist. That was ended. What, Ta what Taryn's really talking about when he says dependency is food stamps and the Medicaid program. And I'll say, I was actually, I grew up on welfare. My mother and my father got divorced. My father left. I had every benefit you can, you, we're talking about today. My mother got on, back then it was AFDC. Uh, my, my father left. We were homeless. We basically moved into an apartment that was subsidized with Section 8 housing. I was on food stamps. Uh, we were on food stamps. I had free and reduced lunch. My mom had never worked a day in her life. And eventually, within a couple of years, got a job as a travel agent. And we went off all of those programs. But I always thought of those programs not for my mom alone, but for me as a child, to make sure that I had real opportunity. My mom was able to get an apartment. We lived in a nice, we lived in, uh, in Bedford, Massachusetts, which had good public schools. I, within a couple of years, she was able to get on her feet and move into a house. She, in so many ways, is the American dream. If you said to her that there were no food stamps or no Medicaid, 
when her kids were five and 10, you just have hungry kids. You just have kids who go sick. I don't think that's the right strategy for the country. I think we should think together about how we can make work pay for everyone. I do not think we have an epidemic of people just staying at home, living on welfare, because welfare doesn't exist anymore. All there is is food stamps and health care for people. There's no way to pay for a roof over your head forever. None of these things exist anymore. There's, there's times you can do that, but there is a lifetime limit. And it is, it is not generous in many parts of the country. So I look forward to an engaged debate on these topics. I hope we can actually talk about the millions of people who are actually working day to day and struggling to make ends meet. Because to me, that is the moral challenge of our time. Thank you. Taryn, uh, five minutes of rebuttal. You can take the uh, podium. Go ahead. It's great to have this conversation. I'd start out by saying, first, work is not a punishment. Work is an opportunity. And I think Nera points out to two different things that are important to recognize. One, we took these principles of welfare reform and work requirements and applied them to one program, welfare cash assistance. Enrollment in that program has dropped by about two thirds as individuals have to work, train, or volunteer to get back into the workforce as quickly as possible. You heard the stat in Texas that a woman, a single mom, because that's the most of who's on welfare cash assistance, will move back to work and off the program if she's meeting that work trainer volunteer requirement in 22 days. What's happened though is rather than apply those same lessons to two other major welfare programs, food stamps for able-bodied adults and Medicaid for able-bodied adults, we've turned our back on that lesson to see what's the quickest and most efficient way to get somebody back to work. There are more people on food stamps today than the entire population of Canada. It's up from just 17 million Americans in the year 2000. That's not the definition of success. That's the definition of failure. But yet at the same time, as she admits, we know what works and what fails when it comes to welfare. It's the requirement of work, train, or volunteer get engaged back into the community as quickly as possible so that individuals can transition off welfare and then get out of poverty as quickly as possible. It's interesting because you're trying to have it both ways. On one hand, you say that people on welfare already work and therefore a work requirement is not needed. Well, the USDA, which oversees food stamps, reports that a majority of able-bodied adults on food stamps have no earned income and only a minority are working at all, and a small minority are working full time. Same is true for able-bodied adults on Medicaid. A majority have no earned income. So it's simply not true. And yet at the same time, you say that if we put into place this work requirement, work trainer volunteer, that it would be harmful for individuals. Well, both statements can't be true. It can't be that everyone's working so you don't need a work requirement, and yet if you had one, it would be harmful. Here are the facts. These aren't made up, these are directly from USDA. Two out of every five able-bodied adults on food stamps have been there at least eight years. 2,900 days. And yet we know that getting somebody to work full-time is the best, the quickest, and the most assured way to get them out of poverty. And yet at the same time that we have near record welfare enrollment for able-bodied adults in these two programs, food stamps and Medicaid, we also have today six and a half million open jobs in America. I think it's odd that regardless of political ideology, in almost every other area, there's consensus on the value of work. For folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities, work is a key goal. In fact, in Washington state, 86% 
of adults with these disabilities are working. Or in substance abuse, individuals who work while in treatment have higher rates of uh, success in recovery. I'm gonna read a quote to you. Effective recovery then, this is from addiction.com, effective recovery almost always involves an individual having gainful employment, finding and keeping a job, and making a contribution to society through his or her efforts. The piece goes on to list 14 different benefits of work. Work is also key in a domestic violence situation so that a woman can break free knowing she can support herself and her children away from her abuser. I saw it firsthand with my own sister. So if work is key from everything for folks with intellectual disabilities, for those in recovery, to those fleeing domestic violence, how is it that it suddenly becomes controversial when we turn to welfare programs to ask work-ready adults to work, train, or volunteer to receive their welfare benefits? How is that morally wrong or controversial? Work is much more than a paycheck. People who work have better health, better mental health, higher rates of happiness, and lower rates of depression, smoking, and obesity. Like Jason and Amanda that I talked to you about, there are millions trapped in dependency who deserve their own success story. Let's agree that in 2018, success will be defined by how many move from welfare to work. Thank you. you uh, uh, five minutes of rebuttal for Mira. I guess I'll just uh, clarify some of the points. I think that we're talking a little bit past each other because when you talk about SNAP, a lot of the people who are taking up SNAP or SNAP are children, elderly, disabled, or in a working household. In fact, four out of every five people who take part in SNAP are one of those categories. Children elderly, disabled, or already in a working household. The thing we're debating truly today, because TANF exists and there's welfare and there's a work requirement around TANF, is whether there should be work requirements around Medicaid and food stamps. And I guess my view of this is pretty simple, which is I'm a gigantic believer in work and I really believe that this notion that people are just don't want to work and just want to stay home. There's no income for them other than food stamps and Medicaid, but that's what they want to do. I just don't think that's realistic. I've lived and been on welfare. I know people want to get off of it. What I would say is, it just my view is it's not, doesn't get anyone a job faster to take away their food stamps. It is not the case since you're only subsidizing food, you're not giving anyone income. The idea that people are just wanting to be on food stamps when they have no income is something that I think our experience belies. As the employment rate has gone up, food stamps has gone down. The food stamp use is not as at its highest point. It is coming down with the employment, with employment rates going up. People are not staying on food stamps as incomes rise. It, it has been a program for people who are struggling. It is a challenge that we have poverty in the United States. I will simply say again, if work requirements ended poverty, poverty would have ended because we have work requirements. Think the reality of the situation we're in as a country is that we do have a continuing challenge of poverty. There are people who are still struggling a lot of them are working. The vast majority of poor people in the United States today are working poor. A work requirement has not ended poverty for them. It still exists. The fact that we have a welfare requirement, a workfare requirement in welfare, which has meant that people spend 22 months in Texas, is simply a tautology. You're right, people have to work, volunteer, and so they do. The reality is that in Texas, the poverty rate is higher than in the average in the United States. That has not ended poverty in Texas. My view is I would love to think through ways to encourage work 
and work that pays. That, I think, is something that actually truly addresses poverty in the United States. The fact that the minimum wage has not kept up with inflation for decades is a true challenge. The fact that millions of Americans work 40, 50, 60 hours and cannot make basic ends meet is a real challenge. I think we should really think through why that is in a country as great as ours. I, I, inc I believe we should encourage work. And the way to do that is to pay a livable wage to people. At the end of the day, I worry about a country and a community and a family in which you say to a child that they shall go hungry because their par parent can't find a job, has particular challenges. I do not think we need to do that in a country as great as ours. I think we should celebrate work by making work pay for all families. That is the best way, path out of poverty. Liberals and conservatives can, can agree that work is at the foundation of this. But health care, hunger are issues that we should say people have a right to. If you're working, you, we still have those challenges. That's why he has a number of 15 million, not 2.5. Thank you. Now, the, uh, as part of the evening, get it, each gets a chance to ask a, a question, two questions of the, of the other. Uh, Taryn, can you go first? Uh, do you have a question for Nira? You've been working in this area for 20 years, and you made the point that we should start thinking about uh, what to do. What's the solution for moving those able-bodied adults, the majority of whom are not working, from food stamps and Medicaid and getting them re-engaged and out of poverty? So you recognize that that 15 million isn't a static number, right? So it's not like 15 million people five years ago uh, and today are the same 15 million people, right? So those people are churning. So a person today who is on the Medicaid program who isn't working is likely, as you know from the statistics, is likely to be working in the next couple of years, right? So it's not a number that we've had year in and year out, 15 million people who, are on, who aren't working, who are in Medicaid or TANF or uh, food stamps. That is a number that's changed over time. So uh, th most of those people are gonna find jobs and some people, many people who have jobs today are going to lose their job at some point in the future and then rely on those programs. So I think the 15 million number is a little, um, per, doesn't give the right impression. It's not like there's 15 million people who've been in an underclass, who've been there year after year after year. They are churning in and out of work, and many of them will go into work and never come back. Many of them will lose a job and stay there for a while. So I think that's the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, Taryn, uh, you, know, you have a question? Um, could you just tell me a little bit more about your uncle and aunt who weren't working? Was that after the uh, TANF, after AFDC was destroyed and became TANF? Okay, well, I'm not, I thought you supported that, but uh, maybe I'm confused. Mm -mm, no. Okay, well, I guess <laughs> I'm confused because I thought you said that that was good that there was a work requirement now in that program. No. Okay. Um, I'm just stating the It was fact. before and after, actually. So did they hit the five-year limit and then end, or did they the commit fraud? The five-year limit at that time uh, wasn't enforced. What do you mean it wasn't enforced? The, There's an automatic rule. They were rule. giving an exemption for, for that limit, for the five-year limit. How? Well, what was the exemption? What was the exemption? It was uh, for um, a variety of, they were determined that for mental health reasons that would not have to work. Not a mental health condition, but for uh, mental uh, health reasons, mostly anxiety. What state was that? Maine. 
because I didn't think that they had that exemption in Maine. Okay, that's interesting, though. I didn't think they had a mental health exemption in, in Maine. Those are my two. <laughs> Taryn, your question. Sure. Um, so I guess I have a question for you as far as considering the life situations of two men. John's on multiple welfare programs, uh, receives about $500 a month in benefits in the value of those welfare programs and has chosen not to work. And then you have Juan who works part-time and earns $500 a month in income. Who do you think's better positioned for future success? Um, so I'm so confused by this um, example because as we've talked about, the TANF program is one in which um, you have to have children to, to use it. The reason that requirement is there is so that if you, so because we believe as a society that children shouldn't be punished for the decisions of their parents. So if it's not that John is a parent, um, he is a, uh, if, then I think you're just talking about uh, food stamps and Medicaid. Correct. So I, I guess I, what I'd say is I don't know many people, and we don't have an experience of a lot of people who have um, food stamps and uh, use the Medicaid program, which is a health insurance program for poor people, most, again, most of whom are working, uh, who, they don't have any income coming in. So, you know, I think most of those people are trying to work. So you don't believe the federal data that a majority have no reported income? Uh, Able-bodied adults who are on food stamps or Medicaid? Well, I've seen, uh, this is a, the, uh, you raise this, and this is a very confusing point, because according to our data, and I'll look through it, is that the SNAP program, food stamp program, which you're right, is in serving around 40 million people. They have, ev there are, as I said, elderly, children, disabled, working person in the family, four out of five SNAP recipients. There are, we do not have a lot of experience with um, millions of food stamp recipients who are able-bodied, live in a household by themselves, working, um, and making like a decent wage because obviously they couldn't. I will say, if someone's making minimum wage, has two kids, can't feed their family, which is hard, you know, you're a single mom, you have two kids, uh, we're talking about $41 an, a day in, in take home pay, $41 a day to pay rent, to pay for food, to pay for everything else. I feel, I'm like, I think it's okay if you're working and you need to use food stamps. Or if you have a disability for a while and use food stamps to make sure your kids don't go hungry. Okay, um, uh, we're gonna be lining up to ask questions. Uh, meanwhile, uh, get uh, to the mic and uh, ask a question. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, I wanna take moderator's prerogative to ask a question of each side. Uh, Taryn, I wanna start with you. Could you pull in a little bit more into those 15 million? Uh, uh, my puzzles are, first, the question uh, that Nira raised about the turnover. Uh, are, uh, you know, are all 15 million of them, you know, do we have a new 15 million every few months? I would suspect that, uh, that of those 15 million, there are a number of them, a fair share, who are pretty permanently in that situation. But then my related question is, what situation are you talking about? They are, uh, are they not on TANF? Uh, how many of them are on TANF, which mean, would mean they have children, and then they're not on TANF, but they're only on food stamps, and uh, Medicaid, then how do they pay their bills otherwise? I want to suggest that possibly they don't have reported income because they're working in the underground economy uh, and that they actually are working, maybe producing something good, maybe pushing drugs, uh, who knows. But could you, uh, could you break down a little bit more, sorry for the complex question, that 15 million that you speak of who are able-bodied who should be working? Yeah. The 15 million able-bodied adults are adults that are either on the food stamp program, who may their able-bodied working age, no disabilities, uh, and a social worker, 
or a doctor have determined that they can work. So we're talking about able-bodied by anyone's definition. Okay. Anira brings in disabled children, elderly. I specifically said in my opening, we're not talking about that. In fact, the report you cite of that a majority of individuals on food stamps are working is from the early 2000s when there was a work requirement in place for childless adults on food stamps. And the USDA has taken down that research off its website because it's inaccurate and out of date. That was when the program was below 20 million. Today, it's over 40 million, about 43 million. So we're talking about adults who are on that program. There's over 15 million of them on food stamps. There's about 22 million who meet that definition who are on Medicaid. So, so you're saying, so, so in other words, you are, you are simply saying then that just one uh, specific statistic is that of the approximately 43 million people who are on food stamps, th the data about them from the USDA that administers the program is that 15 million of those 43 million uh, are, do not have reported income. No, That's 15, all that comes from? 15 million are able-bodied adults yeah. of working age. Oh, and no. a majority of them do not have reported income. Yes. And as you heard me mention, about 40% have been on the program for eight years eight or years. longer. Okay, and that's strictly that's strictly the food stamp, the, what's called the SNAP uh, program. Uh, that's strictly a food stamp number that you're basing that on. And the, but, then, uh, but then a related question, uh, how do you think they, I mean, you, you, can't, uh, you can't put food uh, uh, up on the roof. Uh, how do they live otherwise, do you think? I think there are some that are working in the underground economy. I, I think that what's interesting from the studies of the work requirement going into place is that individuals had an opportunity to work, train, or volunteer in order to continue to receive their benefit. Uh, what happened was a majority went to work right away. So a small portion were working before that. A majority went to work right away. And about 60% went to work over the next year. And so I think what you see is a difference in either they move from unreported income to reported income through a job in the visible economy, or individuals who were making ends meet in some way suddenly go back to work in record numbers, which is what the data shows. And again, this isn't some sample. This is 60,000 individuals in multiple programs in multiple states. Yes, okay, but you're saying 40% of that 15 million that are eight year, they're, they're on the eight year plan at least, so to speak. Uh, but do you have a comment on that, Neera? Yeah, you, I'll, just, I'll just say a, a few things. Yeah. First of all, the report I was using for four out of every five is from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, which was sanctioned by the USDA, and it's from, I believe, five years ago, not from the early 2000s. No, I'm sorry, three years ago, not the early 2000s. Nearly 73% of, American, of Americans who receive some form of government assistance, such as Medicaid, SNAP, and TANF, are members of working families. So, so that, you know, I do think that the vast majority of people in these programs are working. And I would say, I just, you're not actually addressing the issue. Obviously, a lot of people on, on food stamps have been on food stamps for a long time who are working. Sure. Working poor people are on food stamps. Uh, so it's not that, you know, you're right, a lot of people have been on food stamps for a long time. The question I, that I think you were asking were about the 15 million number and whether that is a static number, and it is not. It is not the, it's not the same group of people five years ago as today. There, that number, a lot of, as I said, a lot of people in that number uh, had worked and lost a job and didn't, you know, we chose to not rescind their Medicaid when they lost a job, or their food stamps when they lost a job. A lot of people, uh, a lot of people today who you know who are doing perfectly fine will be that group in the future. I'm, I, I'm sorry, do, are you challenging? If I if I hear Taryn correctly, correct me. He's claiming f 43 million, 15 million, which of course is not a majority by any means. A little over a third, uh, 15 million, uh, are listed by the USDA as not having gainful employment, and and of those 15 million, about 40 percent have been uh, on food stamps for for eight years. So that therefore, so do do you question those particular numbers? I'm sorry. I think the eight million who've been on government who've been on food stamps for eight years are not in the 15 million. I don't, I don't think that's right. We have a disagreement on facts. I don't All right, there's a dis right. disagreement on the facts, yeah. which we'll have to record. Uh, but anyways, do you, do, do you uh, my question to you then, Neera, would be, I wanted to ask you uh, a particular question, but I want to follow up on this issue of facts. 
With respect to the towns claim about 15 million, that about 40% uh, of them are, uh, are on, uh, uh, 15 million not working out of 43 million. Uh, what, what, esti this is taking the, what estimate would you make? How many, what, what number of, of approximately 43 million on food stamps do you think are not working according to your numbers so that at least we can clarify the factual dispute? Uh, so I think the, the truth is that we have two and a half million people today in our economy who are on the TANF program, right? So they are facing work requirements, and the truth is that the TANF program has supported, supports a lot fewer people today than they supported in the 1990s. The, case, the TANF program has been very good at lowering the caseload for TANF. It has been less good as I noted earlier, at eliminating poverty. Poverty is at the same rate it is. I think the big fundamental question is, does a work requirement create a job? I, I do not think work requirements create jobs. I think people are looking for jobs and have found a lot of jobs that don't make ends meet. That's why they are on the Medicaid program. The reason why we have an expansion of Medicaid and take up of Medicaid is because fewer employers at the, at, in lower income jobs offer health insurance. I do not think having a work requirement for Medicaid is going to make a difference in people trying to select jobs because as we've just noted, they don't have income coming in. We can just argue out of nowhere with no facts that they're in the underground economy, but we don't know that. You're just ma we're just saying that as a supposition, but there's no data to say that. These, a lot of these people are working. Are and a lot of people are facing a limited period of time where they don't have a job, and they're still on food stamps. Well, we seem to have a factual dispute about the food stamp number. But, but actually, you anticipated my question, Nira. Do you think, uh, do you think the TANF program has been a failure? I guess you do. Or, 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 or am I misconstruing? Yeah, I think if you, if, for those who thought TANF would limit poverty, would, would move people out of poverty, it has not moved people out of poverty. The poverty rate today is as high, no, I'm sorry, higher than it was uh, before uh, it, we eliminated AFDC. Do you, do, you think that, do you think the work requirement specifically of TANF was a mistake? I think that what we should, I think work requirements are, are, are reasonable if you do take into account recessions. So I think there was a significant problem with the, with the TANF program in that people hit their lifetime limits at a time where we had a grave recession. I think another challenge with the TANF program is that states have basically taken the money that they were supposed to use on poor people and used it for other programs that have nothing to do with poor people. Those, those are two challenges, two fundamental challenges in the TANF program. But I believe if there are jobs available as a principal, people should work. The challenge is that the, the, the people are not finding work that pays enough to make ends meet. We do have, I mean, the largest trend in poverty is not people not working. The largest trend in poverty is the working poor. People who are working 40 hours a week, that is a much larger number of people than people who aren't working at all. Thank you. Uh, first question, please phrase your question as a question. Uh, please tell us who, who you're addressing it to, if anybody. Well, uh, 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 hello, hello. Uh, Gene, I know you like short questions, but uh, uh, I have the mic now. I just want to say, uh, just we ask a question, a long quickly, question. No, I just want to say, uh, thank you for cult cultivating the coolest intellectual hangout in New York City. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you take all uh, the time you want, sir. Okay. <laughs> exactly. I, I I knew how to butter you up, Gene. Okay, so uh, uh, Taryn and Nira, I want to say uh, great points. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to pose a question, uh, a similar question I did at a previous debate. Uh, you know, the relationships between people are sophisticated between people and governments and, and, and families within families. So that being said, I just wonder if uh, the methods that you guys use and the data, how often is it being re-examined uh, to see if it's uh, still relevant, to see if it's true. You guys have, have cited studies offering different numbers, but I, I just wonder, you know, uh, how often you go back to these things because ideological stances can be very rigid 
So I, I, I just wonder if you guys could please uh, touch on this. Thank you. Uh, Taryn, why don't you answer? And, you know, sure, I think it's a great question. Uh, the study that we uh, were involved in, Juan oversaw a second that we were involved in with following 60,000 Americans impacted by a work requirement was done last year. And I think it's a great point. We're looking at doing follow-up tracking studies to see exactly what happens with individuals because I think success is clear that anything that if you individuals successfully move from welfare to work and out of poverty, that's success. And to do so as quickly as possible. And we want to see what are the best reforms that do that. I think that one of the things that's really key in this whole conversation is it's not enough to just want to work. You also need incentives and deadlines. We all respond that way. And so the idea that we're just going to hand out different benefits, whether it's Medicaid or food stamps or cash assistance for able-bodied adults with no criteria that they work, train, or volunteer, I think is just denying basic human behavior. We all respond to incentives and deadlines. So I just need to say this because we keep going on to able-bodied uh, uh, adults. There are no able-bodied adults who get TANF, who get cash assistance, who don't have children. The whole, there's no single guys out there getting TANF who don't have kids, right? The, everybody who gets the TANF program today gets it with children. And if you don't have children, you don't get it. And the reason we do that is in our society, we think kids should not be punished for the decision of their parents. But yet, there still is a five-year limit on that, on that number. So what we're really talking about, again, is food stamps and uh, Medicaid. And we have a fundamental disagreement about whether those incentives are proper. I think it's really, I think you raise an important issue, which is going back and really evaluating what's happening. I think there have been criticisms of the Kansas study by, as I noted, Republicans saying that it hasn't actually had the impact. But I think we should look at Kansas writ large as an example, right? Kansas is a state that did the work requirements. It is a state that dramatically lowered taxes and said that revenues would go up. That is not been true. Revenue did not go up. In fact, revenue dramatically dropped. And the Republican legislature of Kansas just voted to raise taxes to override the governor's veto. There was an ideology that cash what work requirements would end poverty. Poverty has not declined in Kansas, even though what work requirements were done there. I think we should actually look at the Kansas example and say, this is not one that's working for the country. Because the, legisl the Republican legislators in Kansas actually looked at the evidence, looked at what happened in their state, and decided to go in the alternative direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we have uh, two questions that uh, Jim Epstein is going to report uh, from uh, our vast uh, global audience. Take it away. Jim. Okay, the first one is from Carl Crambeck. How about a $9,000 a year universal basic income where everyone gets $750 a month and phase out Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, food stamps, and pretty much all welfare? Uh, $9,000 a year basic income uh, and phase out all welfare. Okay. Uh, do you want to suggest? To, to, uh, and so I. I, I actually do not support universal basic income because I believe that, that uh, we should, people who can work should work if they can. Um, but also I think there is a dignity to work. I myself would say we should have, uh, you know, obviously a little less libertarian than the UBI supporters. I think we should support a minimum wage increase. I think we should think about investments we can make in infrastructure and other areas that can put people to work. That is that bipartisan support. Um, I, I worry uh, that th having a UBI um, is, not, does not, is not a good idea for community, for people. That's why I said at the beginning of this, 
You know, I think there is a dignity in work. I just think that uh, we shouldn't make people go hungry if they can't find a job. Just a comment, there are a number of conservatives, people call themselves conservatives and even libertarians who support a UBI. Fascinating that Neer attend and opposes it. Uh, and uh, just uh, for the record, wanted to mention that. Uh, do you want to comment? Uh, sure, no, I'm also opposed to it. Um, it's interesting, this was on the ballot as a referendum in Switzerland. Uh, and it re was rejected with 80% of the vote. I, I think that what we can do is rather than blow up the system and create something new, we can take principles and requirements that work, that move people from work or from welfare to work as quickly as possible, and we can apply them to the current programs. We don't have to blow up the whole system. And just to follow up on the point about Kansas, but Kansas has a right to change its taxes however they want. What's interesting is there have been no changes to all the welfare reforms, and Kansas's work participation rate is above the national average, and their child poverty rate is dropping. But okay. their work participation rate has been high above the national average for years. I mean, it, it didn't dramatically change with the work requirements, so it's always been very high. It's been higher since the work requirements went into effect at the end of 2013. Okay, uh, next question. Um, so this one's just for Nira. Um, so I'm sympathetic to your basically arguing that the work requirement's not that meaningful, but I have a question for you about your alternative, a minimum wage. So do you believe that a minimum wage has any negative effects, such as reducing the total number of jobs? And if so, could you talk about that, what the trade-offs are? Yeah, there's, I mean, I think economists have looked at this, there are multi, multi uh, huge numbers of economists who've looked at this. Uh, and uh, I think the last CBO analyzed study, uh, most recent data shows that you can get up to $11, $12 without a loss of uh, work. The challenge there is, I mean, there have been people who advocate even higher. The issue on a minimum wage increase is that you are, there have been studies about states uh, in one state where they've raised the minimum wage versus another state where they haven't what you've seen between those two states in terms of uh, job losses, there is obviously a rate at which you can raise the minimum wage and there will be job loss that is not, uh, that is not made up by the fact that people are actually, have more income to buy products. That is the other side of this, right? People raise prices of goods, wages go up, they're able to buy more. So there is a number, economists have said nationally that number, I mean, by, there's a whole range of economists, but the most recent data I've seen has shown $11, $12 an hour does not have the negative impact overall in the economy. But you oppose a $15 minimum wage. I think that's, I think we should really look at that community by community. In some cities you can have, I mean, Seattle raised it to $15 has not seen the negative consequences a lot of people claimed. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should have 15 in some communities like, um, you know, like in uh, rural, in rural parts of the rural communities where that would create some more pressure. Uh, do you want to come in, Jen? Jen? I think we could have a conversation about the minimum wage, but the fact is today in America, there are six and a half million open jobs. So I think before we have a debate about the minimum wage, let's think about how do we move individuals who are able-bodied, who aren't working today, into some of those six and a half million open jobs so they can start experiencing their own American dream. I think that, I, can I just say quickly about this? The question about this, this is a critical issue. The six million jobs in which we do not have people working 70% of those require high skills. I absolutely agree that we the number one priority for the country should be trying to get people into those jobs. They take a skill level that so many people who are churning in and out of the labor force do not have. But I absolutely agree that it would be a high priority for us to ensure that people have the skills for that work. It'd be almost like if you had a requirement to work, train, and get those skills, or volunteer, you might qualify. Right, but how do you get, this is a, this is a great issue, I'm all for that. 
How about who's providing the training? Because that's what the limit has been. They haven't cost. They, there's a cost to that training that people don't have the ability to pay themselves. If you want to, if you want to subsidize that training, we can agree on that. Well, I think you made a great point about uh, TANF funds being available for that kind of training. And I think that absolutely there's money that is already given to governments that can be used for that kind of training. So this is a great example. So the federal government allocated money to states for their caseload. Training would have been a fantastic use of that. So would have, so would have child care, other issues that get people to work. 75% of those dollars have been used for other things entirely, right? So that's why there isn't resources to, to training and other things. But if we can get agreement for you to support federal support for training, I'm, I, can, I can get there really quickly. Then you'll jump on board with universal work requirements? On TANF, which already exists. <laughs> Oh, you favor universal work requirement for TANF. Okay. I, I wasn't joking. Until she opposed it. Get, you favor it until you opposed it. If we get child care and funding for training, I'm all for it. Uh, we don't do those things. Sounds like we're reaching uh, some uh, dialectic uh, agreement here. Uh, uh, next question. Actually, I had a very similar question about minimum wage. That's oh, minimum for wage Karen. So, okay. uh, you know, on the one hand, do you think that having a higher minimum wage would incentivize people to get off welfare? And kind of the flip side of that is if there is no minimum wage and wages are low and you could make nominally or marginally less by staying on welfare, doesn't that sort of incentivize you to just stay on welfare instead of working if you're going to be ba basically making the same thing but you have to work 40, 50 hours a week? I think that we have to be very careful that we make the first step up the economic ladder higher and higher, whether that's by adding occupational licensing standards and making people go through literally sometimes years of training uh, for jobs that they could maybe apprentice and then move into. Uh, I, I think that the key is for individuals to move from not working at all to work, train, or volunteer, get re-engaged back into the community. And I think that that is key. The best way to get a job is to have a job. And so even if somebody moves into part-time work, that person is much more apt to then get a full-time job. The, and the best way, honestly, to raise the minimum wage is to have a strong economy because then businesses have to raise it to attract workers. I was driving by a McDonald's the other day with my kids. There's a hiring sign, minimum starting wage, $13 an hour. It's higher than the state minimum wage, but a strong economy and a demand for workers. What we need to have is reflect that demand in our welfare programs by saying to folks, this is a relationship. Work, train, or volunteer. That's how you keep your benefits. But ultimately, we want you out of poverty. That's success. It's not success to have these welfare programs go faster and faster, and the poverty rate to remain unchanged, as even Nira admits. Um, I think what's, I, what I, I kind of find fascinating about this is, you, you know, we do have facts here about the minimum wage and other things. Minimum wage today has the purchasing power of the minimum wage in the like, 1960s. It has not kept up, kept up in, with inflation. Uh, it does not have, uh, you know, it would have, I think the last study I saw was that if the minimum wage kept up with where it was when uh, over the last 40 years, it would be at $20. Uh, I'm not even arguing for $20, but that just tells you how much less purchasing power there is in the minimum wage. Just to go to your point, we have four, uh, we have low unemployment in the country, very low unemployment, yet wages, particularly for the bottom, have been stuck. You know, we are not getting year over year over year wage gains, even though we are at 4.5% unemployment. Why? Because unemployment is really 2% if you've gone to college and 7.5% if you haven't gone to college. We have a challenge, which is that work at the low end is not creating economic mobility. Now, I think the true outrageous problem in the country is that people would go hungry if it weren't for food stamps and work 40, 50 hours a week. And I think that it, the way I look at that is the federal government is subsidizing private entities to not give a living wage. I don't know why we don't look at it that way. You know, I mean, in other countries, they manage to solve these problems. We should think about creative ways to address that. I do not understand why people working many hours 
and have to be on programs to ensure their kids don't get poverty. Why do we not ask why these work employers don't provide health care? Our answer is just don't have health care. Why don't we say employers, why aren't they covering this with health care? Right? We have a Medicaid program for working poor people. The vast majority, as I said, of people on the Medicaid program in the expansions are working poor people. That, I think, is a challenge we should all think about. Uh, next question. What? Uh, just two quick questions. One, do you both support increasing the earned income tax credit? And two, do you both support uh, government creating jobs like, like the WPA, like they did in the New Deal? Um, what do? Sure. If you look at the earned income tax credit today, almost any size family, if you have one person working full time at a minimum wage job with the earned income tax credit, that family is out of poverty. And so I think that you have a strategy that then rewards work in that area, uh, particularly for parents and those with kids. Uh, as Nira admits, we prioritize as a country. Um, I think that that's a strategy that's already in the tax code and it's already available to people and ensures that even if you're working in a minimum wage job, almost regardless of the size of your family, you're out of poverty with that assistance. So I think that's in place right now uh, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, uh, there is no EITC for childless adults. But if they're working full time at a minimum wage job, they're out of poverty. Their income's above the poverty limit. Okay. So uh, for anyone who, uh, so I think we need to do, I, I would definitely support an EITC expansion, which I think is definitely work focused. Um, there are questions about the uh, EITC expansion for, I mean, the EITC rates for families like yours with eight kids. Um, and I think we should just say that people who work full time shouldn't be in poverty, which is does not exist today because the EITC does not guarantee that as a, as a matter of course for every family. But I, I definitely think that they should do, that we should have the EITC. Well, and there was a second question? Um, I, Oh, about government creating jobs, new deals. Government yeah, care. so I, you know, I think um, that jobs should be a focus. Uh, you know, there are areas like infrastructure, which Republicans and Democrats have supported, which aren't public jobs. They're basically the government, you know, federal government puts up money and supports private sector employment. I think we should think a lot more about those, those ideas in communities that have had uh, have had high unemployment for a long time. I think there there are strategies, and I think if you really think work should be at the center of your economic mobility strategy, then I think you should also think about uh, investing in areas where you'd put people to work more directly. You want to I just think on that point, uh, certainly when you looked at when the modern welfare state began, in the 1930s, that's how they did it. Individuals worked in those government-provided jobs. But we even have examples uh, from today of that that can be a successful strategy. Uh, the mayor of Milwaukee uh, employed that strategy with homeless in this their city, guaranteed that if you're homeless, you have a job, a maintenance job, uh, lawn-keeping kind of job. Uh, in Milwaukee, the effect was a dramatic reduction in homelessness because it got people engaged in work and then it made it, e it, made it easier for them to move to another job. So I think it's an effective strategy. All right, uh, sorry, uh, the Q&A uh, session is over. Uh, those of you who still want to ask questions, uh, get a chance to talk to the debaters after we adjourn uh, for the wine and the food. Uh, Taryn, uh, five minutes uh, of, of uh, summary, please. Take the, take the, uh, the podium. First, I want to thank you all for a lively and engaging evening on an important topic. In closing, work is not a punishment. Work's an opportunity. As I mentioned, work people who work, uh, they receive so much more than a paycheck. People who work have better health, better mental health, higher rates of happiness, lower rates of depression, lower rates of smoking, lower rates of obesity. And while we have this civil debate in this theater, when we leave here today, will be reminded of the faces of dependency. This isn't just a debate, though, about government and government policy. 
You know, a few years ago, a mentor asked me, Taryn, what have you done personally to engage in these things you care about? And debates don't count. <laughs> it was a humbling moment for me. So I decided to do something about it because I thought he really had a point. Let me tell you about Levinson. I had the chance to meet this young man at a nonprofit I helped start as a direct result of this call to action to engage personally. Our organization partners with churches to host job fairs in tough neighborhoods. Levinson had been fired from his last retail job for accidentally leaving the door unlocked. We all make mistakes or forget things, but such a moment cost him his job. And being out of work made him spiral to a dark place where he lost faith in himself and his future. And what Levinson really needed was encouragement and coaching. He needed to sell himself and to stand out in the crowd. And our job fair gave him that chance. My coaching helped prep him and helped him answer the tough questions that might come in an interview. And he got a job. You know, people coming through the front door of these job fairs may or may not be on welfare, but they all need so much more than government alone can provide. Another young woman, Alicia, was coached at a different job fair. She had a criminal record and was on welfare. And it took a job at the fair for her to see that dependency didn't define her. In fact, during her first six weeks on the job, Elisa was promoted twice. And now her criminal record and welfare are her past. And her future is bright. You know, this isn't just about two people. I'm proud to stand here today to tell you that 8,000 people have walked through these job fairs in just over a year, and most get a job. And you know the biggest moment of clarity for me? A bell. A staff member created the Opportunity Bell, which the employer and the job seeker ring together when that job seeker gets hired on the spot. And about one in 10 people do. And when that bell rings, everyone in the job fair stops and claps. It's so inspiring. It's an incredible feeling. And to me, it shows how important work is to the human spirit. And our goal in 2018 is to serve 25,000 across the country from LA to Washington, DC, from Waterville, Maine to Fort Myers, Florida. And I'd like to personally invite every one of you here including you, to come and join us in person at one of these job fairs. The one thing we require is that you care and believe in the human spirit. Look, this really isn't a debate. It's a call to action of what you should do, what I should do, what business should do, and what government should not do to support real opportunity for the millions of Americans trapped on welfare and in despair. That man from Cuba I told you about, not only did he come here to start a better life, but he's transforming every generation thereafter. The truth is that protecting the truly needy, something we all support, requires that those on welfare who can and should work do so. A strong safety net for the truly needy is financed by a strong America of those who should work doing so including the at least 15 million able-bodied adults trapped on welfare today. Thank you. Five minutes of summary from you, Anira. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess I'll just say the following, which is I, I see areas of agreement. You know, I think we should have policies to support input, to support actual jobs and people who work in, in work full-time not being in poverty. I hope those are Arab principles we can all agree with. I think that is ultimately what we have to get to. I guess the concern I have is, I'll just walk through my own private, my own experience. So I am a product of the dreaded welfare state. My parents got divorced, my father left, my mother had never worked, and she went on welfare, Section 8 housing, food stamps, every program we're talking about. Faceless bureaucrats somewhere decided to invest in those programs so when people 
are harmed, they have an opportunity. I guess what I'm saying to every person in this room is that if my mother had a challenge finding a job, couldn't find work, or had some reason she didn't, like she had a problem, I'm glad America never said to me, you go hungry. You don't have health care for those decisions. I think we have a fundamental challenge in this country, much bigger in numbers than the people cycling in and out who don't have a job. We have millions of people who work every day and can't make ends meet. They can't afford health care on their own. That's why they use Medicaid. They can't feed their kids. That why, that's why they use food stamps. And that's the challenge that we have as a country that I hope liberals and conservatives, people of goodwill, can tackle together. Thank you. go on your program again, you'll see the post-debate vote is available to you. Uh, 15 million able-bodied adults on government welfare would have a better chance at economic betterment if they were taken off welfare. Uh, please vote uh, your final decision, yes, no, or undecided. Uh, please vote uh, to those uh, who are listening on streaming, vote yes, no, undecided. Uh, we are closing the voting. Uh, 15 million able-bodied adults on government welfare would have a better chance at economic betterment if they were taken off welfare. As I've said, uh, next uh, month, we're going to have the debate between me and Yaron Brook on uh, selfishness and uh, a great sequel to this uh, evening. And uh, he's going to be uh, talking about selfishness being a virtue. I'm going to take the negative. Uh, and uh, February, uh, we're going to have uh, a debate uh, about sex offenders. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, sex offenders, as you know, have to go on a registry. And uh, the uh, proposition will be that uh, the registry should be abolished. Uh, and that will be a sizzling debate. Uh, on, in uh, March, we're going to have a debate about the rape culture. Uh, in uh, April, we're going to have a debate about, uh, uh, about uh, 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 fractional reserve banking uh, in the Federal Reserve being a threat uh, to the stability uh, of the economy. Uh, in uh, June, we're going to have a, a debate about uh, constitutionalism, the, the originalist approach uh, of Randy Barnett's to the Constitution uh, uh, will be uh, defended. Uh, in July, uh, we're going to have a debate about Bitcoin. Uh, as you know, if you go on our website, we sell discount packages um, so that you can buy uh, and, and reserve tickets uh, to, uh, to a few uh, of the debates. Um, so uh, please come again. Uh, and uh, I'm now looking at uh, the voting. Uh, the votes are still coming in on this issue. And um, I'll uh, give it, uh, oops, just give it a, uh, just a minute more. Uh, please stick around. Uh, we are going to have a party until 9 o'clock. I trust our debaters are going to stick around so that you can really bore in on the topic. We've just, uh, we've, we've had an intellectual marathon, as all debates are. Now comes the real in-depth discussion that you're going to have over a glass of wine or a soft drink with Nira um, or with Taryn. Um, and uh, uh, bear in mind, of course, that uh, this uh, before and after voting is just a game, but always helps focus our mind on what is um, on, on the issues. Um, and um, I'm uh, going to have to wait uh, another minute uh, for uh, and so to oops, so for the for the for the votes to come in. Uh, but right now, I think I can finally close the voting, which I'm going to do. Um, okay, uh, well, it was pretty close. Uh, uh, the yes votes uh, stood at 41% uh, initially and uh, picked up 21.5%, uh, but went up to 62.5%. So uh, Taryn picked up uh, nearly 22 points, so that's uh, the, uh, the points to, to beat. Uh, uh, Nira picked up uh, nearly six points. So everybody won. <laughs> Uh, but 
So congratulations to Neil, uh, but, uh, but Taryn gets the Tootsie Roll. So congratulations to both of you. <laughs>